as to their event so that you can share ideas and the possibilities of Africa's tomorrow. It used to be the other way around. In Africa's first fading old days, it was us, not the, the youth, the parents, to summon the children. But roles are reversing, and you have no option but to comply. There could not be a better time for Africa, and Kenya in particular, to be talking about the youth and their views and the role in our society. Let me state from the outset that I have always been and I remain a firm believer in the potential and power of the young people to shape the future of Africa. I know firsthand that many of the great developments that have been achieved in Africa, including here in Kenya, were pushed and forced by the young people. Without fear of doubt or doubts, I can state categorically that I am honored to have been a key player in the youth movements that transformed Kenya into a democracy and open society of sorts in my years of youth. By age, Africa is an extremely young continent. Today, around 60% of Africa's 1.5 billion people is younger than 25 years. More than a third of Africa's total population is between 15 and 34 years old. It is therefore obvious that the solution to some of the greatest challenges facing our continent lies with the youth. The youth live with those challenges and they are expected to resolve those challenges as we move forward. So I've said that the youth is a potential. If you um, you empower them. If you don't empower them, they become delinquents, drug addicts, thieves, and criminals. But if you empower them with the knowledge, access to knowledge, and access to opportunities, then they become a very powerful force for wealth creation in a society. But the youth will not be able to provide solutions to our problems unless they are empowered. As a leader, I remain deeply committed to seeing a continent that provides opportunities for our young people. I'm committed to ensuring that the youth are a change agent today as they make their way to being leaders of the continent. To this end, I believe you have the responsibility of ensuring that our boys and girls get equal access to education, that we give them skills to strengthen their leadership in every aspect of society, including business, academia, civil society, and politics. I believe that Africa has the responsibility of providing our young entrepreneurs and would be entrepreneurs with the capital and networks to grow businesses and pursue innovations. In other words, we have a responsibility to help the youth help themselves and our continent. We are currently in the era of pursuing Africa's renaissance. The term renaissance itself evokes a rebirth, a renewal of spirit, and a resurgence of greatness. This is precisely what Africa needs in the 21st century. No segment of any population represents the rebirth and renewal of spirit better than the youth. In their hands lies the power to transform challenges into opportunities, 
to harness innovation for sustainable development and to drive social change that benefits all Africans. The African Renaissance we envisage is not merely an economic or political ambition. It must also be a cultural and intellectual awakening. It's called for a reclamation of our heritage, a celebration of our diversity, and a commitment to unity amidst our differences. As leaders and stakeholders, we have a responsibility and duty to listen to the voices of our youth, empower their aspirations, and provide them with the platform they need to contribute meaningfully to our shared future. Their energy, idealism, and determination are the driving forces behind the resurgence of Africa on the global stage. We have a duty to harness this potential, nurture their talent, and jointly embark on a journey towards an African Renaissance that leaves no one behind. But our young people must not just rely on their adults to help them deliver Africa's future for their dreams of their dreams. Our young people must learn to work together, learn, to learn from one another, avoid the divisions of the past, and with the change they wish to see on the continent. As young people, there's a very solid foundation and tradition to build on. The foundation and tradition are the joint efforts and sacrifices of all the generations of Africa's founders who led our continent to independence, which did not come easy. We got where we are, we are today by working together and imagining a future. They may have fell short of their own aspirations, but they did lay a firm foundation on which you can build new plans for a perfect continent. You have come of age in an era of breathtaking change. You have come of age in the age of technology and an interconnected world. Today the world has become a global village. When I was living in Europe, a letter, it's called surface mail, would take three weeks to arrive. To arrive. Then came the email, sorry, the air mail, would take one week to arrive. Then came the express air mail, three days. And you are very surprised, you are very happy that it has only three days. Then came the, the telex, and then came the fax machine, and then came the uh, mobile phone, the analog, and then now here, today we are. The world has become truly a global village. Just within a very short period of time, in my lifetime. So these are fundamental changes that have taken place. I encourage you to resist attempts to isolate the continent in a globalizing world. I encourage you to ignore the notion that the world is controlled by forces that you can't overcome and control. I encourage you to immerse yourself into this world with a view to taking complete control of it for the sake of Africa. You must take a longer and more optimistic view of the world, guided by our resilience as African people. Africa is the richest continent on the surface of the earth in terms of resources. Yet it is a paradox that the richest continent is also the poorest in terms of the living conditions of its people. But this is a situation that we can change. It is possible to change this situation. 
I have had an opportunity to work for the continent as the African Union High Representative on Infrastructure Development. It gave me a first-hand opportunity to understand our continent, its peoples, and its challenges. There we were dealing with major infrastructural projects which have been conceived by the African Union. The highways, Trans-African highways, Cape Town to Cairo. That project was coined by a white South African, Sir Cecil Rhodes, over 100 years ago. Uh, to build a, a highway from the Cape Town to Cairo. After today, that highway has not been built. There are still missing links to it. Another one is from Tripoli to the Cape, which is also there. There are several missing links which has not been completed. Another one is from Dakar in Senegal through the Sahel to Djibouti. Another one is Dakar to Lagos, Lagos to Mombasa, which has also not been constructed. Then you have got Trans-African High-Speed Railway Network, <coughs> one from Beira in Mozambique all the way to Wolves Bay in Namibia. The other one is from Lagos along the coast to Cotonou in Benin, to uh, Lomé in Togo, Accra in Ghana, to Abidjan in uh, Côte d'Ivoire, all along to Guinea, to Mauritania, to Morocco, to Algeria, to Libya, Tunisia, up to Cairo. And then another one, which we had coined from here, Lapset. Lamu Port, South Sudan, Ethiopia Transport Corridor. But then as AU, we, we, we modified. It will go Lamu, one branch will go to Ethiopia, the other one to Juba, and then to Bangi in Central African Republic, and then to Cameroon Port of Kribi to create a land bridge that links the Atlantic Ocean to Indian Ocean, and then opening up the interior, the landlocked countries in Africa for trade. The labor goods coming from the East, from Japan, from China, from India, from the Middle East, to come to Lamu, and then by train, transported across to those countries like South Sudan, North Sudan, Chad, Niger, uh, Congo Brazzaville, up to Nigeria. Because the African Union had come up with uh, African free trade uh, area uh, uh, agreement. But how does Africa trade with itself without the proper infrastructure? Here you in Kenya, between Kenya and a country called Central African Republic, there's only South Sudan. But how do you get your goods to, to Central African Republic? How do you get your tea from Kenya to Central African Republic where they don't grow tea? You have to find a ship that will go down Cape, 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 Cape Coast and go up along the, the coast Namibia, Angola, out, up to Cameroon, and then pick it from Douala by road to Bangi in the Central African Republic. The French and the British are much faster there than you. That's why in Bangi, in Central African Republic, they drink Kenyan tea, Christian as English breakfast tea. But if you do the proper infrastructure, you can reach there, only South Sudan is between you and Central African Republic. There are several others who are dealing with high, high uh, speed fiber optic network. 
to link several African capitals so that communication is easier. We're dealing with uh, open skies. How to make the air transport easier across the continent of Africa. At the moment, air transport is so expensive in our continent. Why? Because they don't have a proper air control system. Each country has got its own individual air traffic control uh, uh, system. So if you want to fly from here, you have to pay overflight fees to several countries you're going to go ac across, from here to Lagos, so many countries. Yeah, the other day I was going for a funeral of a president of Namibia, and we chattered and we aircraft to drive Nairobi to Windhoek, Namibia. You have to get clearance from Tanzania, uh, from DRC, from uh, Zambia, from uh, Botswana, and Namibia. We are spending three hours on the ground at Wilson Airport because we do not have a clearance over, over, over to fly over Tanzania. At that time, I was stranded in Dar es Salaam trying to get to, to Niamey in Niger. Yeah, because you have to get a clearance over Uganda, DRC, Central African Republic, Cameroon, Nigeria, Niger. You don't need those kind of things in Europe. You, because they have got one standardized air control system that gives you clearance and you can fly over all those countries in Europe. And it's cheaper. These are some of the things which can be changed and we are dealing with this. Then we are dealing with energy. Energy is so expensive on the continent of Africa. You go to a place like uh, uh, the Gambia, it costs you 38 US cents by unit. In some other places in Europe, it is two cents. How can you compete with those who are producing energy at two cents, yet you here are buying it at 38 cents? Yet Africa has got abundance of energy source, particularly what you can call uh, green energy. The solar, the wind, the waves, 